Cybersecurity. Here are your co-hosts and cybersecurity experts, Brian Horning, Reginald Andre, and Randy Bryan. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Security Squad podcast. Today is October 17th, 2023. I think we're heading into like our third year now, Andre. Yeah, we got to start keeping track of episode numbers. Like episode know, right? 232. Yeah, this is the, uh, <clears throat> the podcast where we talk about cybersecurity and kind of what's going on out there in the world and try to help educate people and make them aware of what they need to be aware of when it comes to cybersecurity and how to start protecting themselves um, and get it, getting ahead of the game. And today, on today's show, we're going to jump into a lot of topics. We're going to couple. We're going to cover a couple uh, cybersecurity ransomware cyber attack events uh, quickly at the top of the show, and then we're going to dive into some discussions around some articles and trends that we found interesting over the last week that we've kind of come across and think it's important enough to have a discussion about. So we'll get into those as we cruise around the internet. But remember, as part of this show, we ask you to pay the fee similar to other podcasts you may be familiar with. Um, we don't run ads. We don't bore you with annoying uh promotional products throughout the show. We don't promote anything on this show. We just talk about cybersecurity and we share with you our expertise and our insight around various cybersecurity topics. And the fee is pretty simple. You just share the show. You just help us spread the word. You give us a like, share us out on your social media, wherever you may find us. If you're listening to us, you can rate us. All those things help these platforms bump up our visibility to other people who may be interested in the same topic. So did I cover everything there, guys? Is there anything you need to add to the fee? Nothing to add, but uh, December of 2020 is when we started. So about a couple of months and we'll be at three year mark. Wow. Nice. Wow. So uh, guys, <clears throat> today we have to uh, jump into a, a couple quick cyber attacks that we don't have a ton of information about it this time, but we're going to talk about them nonetheless. Um, we have a, I believe, uh, I have to pull this up here real quick, um, but I believe this is a Comcast owner or Comcast part. It's, an own, it's owned by Comcast. The company's name is Ampersand, um, and it's owned by actually Comcast Charter and Cox. Wow, I don't, I don't know how that happens. Um, but they provide viewership data to advertisers for about 85 million households and has existed since 1981. And last weekend, the Black Bastards, uh, they claim to have attacked the company, according to cyber researcher Dominic Alvi Eri. In a statement to uh, Recorded Future News, where we're reading this from, uh, the company confirmed that it had dealt with a ransomware incident, but declined to say when the attack occurred or whether a ransom would be paid. Um, thoughts on this, guys? Uh, owned by three of the largest cable operators in the United States. Um, sounds like some kind of maybe Nielsen ratings type of company um, that's obviously not independent. Uh, I guess where they try to use this data to be able to put a number on what it costs for a commercial and things like that on TV. Um, this is a treasure trove. Yeah. You think? I'm, oh, yeah. I'm imagining the executives of Black Basta sitting around. They've got all this data. They want to put it into chat GPT and they're like, you know what we need? Dude, if we had viewership and stuff like that, that gave us all kinds of personal habits of people that we could just suck that data at, out and throw it into. Let's call it bad GPT. OK, so there's regular chat GPT, which is a good guys. And then there's bad GPT. And this is pull it all into bad GPT and use that to craft phishing um, attacks because 95 percent of all attacks start with a phishing email. I mean, this is a treasure trove, man. Yes, executives. Sorry, there's a chat in the green room about that. But you know what I'm saying? I imagine they're smoking cigars and thinking how they can be worse. How can we do more bad things? And this, even if it didn't all go down like this, 
this data is so valuable to be able uh, to get it for the bad guys to be able to get a hold of this. And it's uh, no surprise that uh, this company got compromised because the three companies that own them, Comcast, Charter, and um, Cox, have all had their recent shares of uh, different experiences with um, with ransomware and cyber attacks. So it was only a matter of time to this one. Yeah, it's gosh, it's, it's true. I mean, it's interesting because we've seen it before where um, ransomware groups hack a company like this and just because they now know okay you're you're basically owned by three of the biggest cable companies and just like we saw with like when apple's partners get hit they try to go after a ridiculous amount of money that you know this ampersand probably can't really afford but they're thinking well you know you're the three companies that own you can kind of kick in and help pay for what we're asking for and Black Basta to me is one of those groups that would 100%, you know, do this and, and ask for way more money than what this company can probably handle and what their cyber insurance probably covers them for. So we uh, will update everybody on this. Um, there's not too much more about this whole thing, uh, but as we learn more, uh, we will update everybody on the show here. So. Um, the next one is this Henry Shine is another uh, company that's dealing with a cyber event. Um, and on Saturday, the 14th of October, uh, Henry Shine, which is NASDAQ symbol is HSIC, determined that a portion of its manufacturing distribution businesses experienced a cybersecurity incident. Uh, Henry Schein promptly took precautionary action, including taking certain systems offline and other steps intended to contain the incident, which has led to temporary disruption of some of Henry Schein's business operations. The company is working to resolve the situation as soon as possible. And just in case you didn't know, uh, Henry Schein is a solutions company for healthcare professionals powered by a network of people and technology. With more than 23,000 Team Shine members worldwide, the company network of trusted advisors provides more than 1 million customers globally with more than 300 valued solutions that help improve operational success and clinical outcomes. Our business, Our clinical business. technology, and supply chain solutions help office-based dental and medical practitioners work more efficiently so they can provide quality care more effectively. These solutions also support dental laboratories, government and institutional health care clinics, as well as other alternate care sites. Henry Shine operates through a centralized and automated distribution network with a selection of more than 300,000 branded products and Henry Shine private brand products in our distribution centers. So guys, this is essentially a supplier for um, doctor's offices and, and medical offices around the country, providing them with certain supplies in their offices so they can they can operate. That's that's what this company does in a nutshell. Yeah, uh, while you were talking and reading the article, I was Googling Henry Stein and just to see if I can find any other information. And, oh, got an echo there, Randy, I think. Um, and the only thing I could find is an attorney's office that says if you receive um, some type of notification letter from Henry Schein to contact them because they're working on the class action lawsuit. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, class action lawsuits all 100% be one of the things that pop up out of something like this. But like we see with uh, gro like the grocery store one that we talked about last week, right, where people started to notice, um, you know, groceries and, and things missing off the shelves as a result of um, that uh, cooperative that was attacked. In this case, what you're going to start seeing is you're going to show up to the dentist's office mm -hmm. and they're not going to be able to perform certain things, um, you know, that you may need done or that you're scheduled to have done. And because they can't get you know, cleaning tools, certain certain things that Henry Schein provides these offices, 
you're going to either have your appointments canceled or you're, you're not going to be able to receive the, the full care that you think you're going there for. So that's that's the big impact to most people that they're going to notice as and the longer that this drags on, the, the more likely it is that your doctor is going to run out of things uh, that you, they may need to care for you. So anything else you guys yeah, want to add to that one? Yeah, just a tiny bit. A lot of these big providers like this for medical offices, they provide everything from A to Z, um, yep. you know, and on, on both sides. So they have practice management, they have supplies, you can get basically everything from them. We've seen in other industries that have been hit, like <clears throat> I believe it was uh, Cisco, Cisco Foods, I believe when they were hit, um, I believe it was them. It might have been Benny Keith, but it was one that was local to this area that that was specifically for restaurants. But once again, they provided everything and that being down caused the customers to have to go elsewhere to get what they needed. Um, that's going to be a potential risk here, a potential problem here for Henry Shine's company um, that their their customers are going to look to the other providers in the field that are kind of the all in one. Maybe they don't just provide the practice management software, but they're providing some of the supplies and things like that. One company's down, so they turn to another company to get to get it. So it's going to have a negative impact on them, most likely in that respect as well. Yeah, 100 percent. So we'll see what the outcome is with this and, and what products and what things kind of, you know, were what, what what services are impacted by these doctor's offices that are going to probably experience some kind of disruption in their business in some way, shape or form here in the, in the next uh, coming weeks uh, until they get out of this. So moving right along, guys, um, we have Kansas courts, IT systems offline after a security incident. Um, and this article goes on to say the information systems of state courts across Kansas are still offline after they've been disrupted and what the Kansas, Kansas judicial branch described last Thursday as a security incident. Uh, multiple systems crucial to daily court operations across the state have been impacted, including the Kansas courts e-filing system used by attorneys to submit case documents, the electronic payment system. Uh, and the case management system employed by district and appellate courts for case processing. So not the first time we've seen something like this, guys, where this side of uh, local government has, is impacted um, and, and we know what happens, right? Cases are delayed. Things, things get just hairy now because, you know, most, most of, if not all of the United States has moved to an e-filing system for courts. Um, and when those go down, it, it really puts a grinding halt to the whole entire judicial system. Uh, and we've seen this multiple times throughout the U S over the last couple of years. Um, you know, we see it all, we see a lot with municipal governments in general, but we do, we have seen quite a few cases uh, where this uh, where the judicial branch is uh, been down for a while um, and, it, and it really does impact a lot of things when it comes to being able to get businesses uh, um, business done. You know, you think about it's not just people suing one another. It's people who need to go to court to get variances, to have buildings. You know, it, it, it can hurt the economy in a lot of ways when courts can't process things. That's, you know, that's the bottom line here. So thoughts on this, guys? What's happening in Kansas? Pretty, pretty run in the mill, cut and dry, or are you seeing it another way? No, uh, cut and dry. Is this the same one that we uh, did last week? When yep. We were yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, we, seen we, touched on it. we touched on it a little bit. Right. But they're still down. Um, this article that we're looking at today is obviously October 16th, which was yesterday. Yeah. Um, so they're still they're still dealing with it. Yeah. One interesting thing it says is um, courts will accept paper filings and filing by fax. However, if you're fax filing and payment is required, you can't do the fax filing. So it's like in right. today, there's no like nobody's thought of like, OK, if the payment system go down and the fax and you need the fax, what other way can someone pay? What backup method can we have? 
So it's just little things that people just don't think about that could could very well happen. And why is that? Because they don't do incident response planning, right? Yep. So they're going to have, have couriers and people delivering actual physical checks, it sounds like, or going by the mail. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, guys. So, Randy, did you remove that article that we were going to talk about? I'll, I'll, um, I don't I'll, think so. All right. Let me jump I can add it back. Yeah. Um, Boom. <laughs> thanks, buddy. <laughs> So what? So um, that kind of wraps it up for our, you know, the attacks that we wanted to cover for the last week, um, and we want to move into some discussions about some of the trends that we're seeing with this cyber with cybersecurity and some of the things that we're seeing out there. Randy brought forth an article that I thought was worth talking about for at least a little while, um, you know, but this whole idea of cyber resilience, right? We hear, um, <clears throat> we've heard this word uh, probably, you know, maybe last two or three years, probably more like two years, um, where we're talking about being cyber resilient, right? And, and what that essentially means to me anyway, is being able to withstand anything and still being able to operate. And this is no different than business continuity planning, but today, when we're so tech heavy in business and we're so reliant on tech, um, cyber resiliency has kind of been the, been the new buzzword that people like to use when it comes to things like business continuity. Um, but cyber resiliency at the end of the day is being able to put systems and processes in place in your business um, so that if you do have to go through an event, whether it be a cyber attack a natural disaster, you know, any kind of an event that could impact your business, you know, you have to really kind of evaluate your environment to figure out all the different things and all the risk you have in your business. But at the end of the day, whatever the risk is, being cyber resilient means that you have these systems and plans and processes in place that when things go down, it doesn't impact your operations and it doesn't impact your customers and, and what they see and how they interact with your business. And we see businesses fail at this constantly across the board. Um, and that's why I wanted to kind of discuss this article because it's suggesting that the standard be that businesses achieve a, a level of cyber resilience. Um, and, you know, what do you guys think about that? I, 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 you know, I think it's a lofty goal personally um, for where we're at today, um, but I think it's definitely where we need to be rowing the boat. Um, I don't know if we'll get there <laughs> in my lifetime, um, but I think over time, I think businesses are going to learn that this is a pretty important step in your business planning processes. Uh, yeah, this... Um... Just take 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 into account the attacks that we just looked at. Um, specifically, you know, Henry Shine. That's literally going to cost them money. Um, that's literally going to cost them potentially money, lost business, employee morale, um, employees leaving because it because it creates chaos when this kind of stuff happens. We could probably go around the, the 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 Zoom room here and figure out, you know, each come up with four or five things that are going to happen because of that one attack. And so you come down to this idea of cyber resiliency. You know, to me, when I think cyber resiliency, I think about segmentation, zero trust. I think about, you know, uh, limiting the scope of a blast radius to where an attack happens. It doesn't blow up the entire company. It causes something and we fix it and we get right on. So as the number of attacks go up, the cost for those attacks go up, the, the value of cyber resiliency is growing day by day, because if we can be cyber resilient, then we 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 have an attack it doesn't bring down the whole thing 
and we just move on. And so all of these costs that I mentioned, and like I said, we could probably each mention five different ones, but all of these, all of these costs then are, are limited or mitigated. And, and so the business is able to move on. That's how I see this, this article that it's just, it's growing in value to produce a company that can handle these things that are going on out there. And they just be little glitches, little blips instead of the end of the end of the life of the company. I love the idea. Um, the only thing I can, the only problems that I see is that it, it think of it as a like a think tank. It's going to take a lot of people to sit in the room to go through this process to think about all the different scenarios. And then the hardest part is now implementing and making sure that the actual practice is done by the users or whatever need like whatever money needs to be spent and whatever training needs to be done and things like that. So I see it great in theory um, and for maybe larger companies. Sorry, I keep on getting an echo. Uh, but maybe for the, um, Randy, if you want to mute when I talk, yeah, thanks. Uh, but I think for the larger companies, I think it's going to be great. Smaller businesses, um, it's going to take time and I can see some pushback. So time... Andre, time to implement or time to convince them that they need to do it? No, implementation. And what kind of time are you talking about? Like, so if I have a business and I I come to your company and I say, hey, I want to be cyber resilient. How long do you think it would take? And I don't mean to put you, I'm not like putting you on the spot. No, no, I, I got it. I got it. Yeah. The, the thing like, is, it's like for some of, at least from some of my clients, it's hard for me just to have a quarterly meeting with them just to tell them what's going on and what we should be doing. Now we're taking it. But if we got the buy-in from ownership or, or the board, that's a different story. But but it's going to be a hard sell to the client because they're trying, they're like, I thought you were taking care of this type of attitude. So that's why I said it just really just depends. Bigger organizations I could, I, I could see this flying, but smaller businesses, 20, 50 users, it's going to be tough, at least on my side. I think especially in 2023, we're, we're kind of in a paradox this, this year where we've seen a lot of signs of uh, economic slow, slowness, if you will, um, seen a lot of signs of companies trying to cut costs evaluate costs, make sure everything looks good. And all that said, at the same time, attacks going up, we're seeing companies, you know, have to pay lots of money because of attacks. And so there's just this whole idea of cyber resiliency um, and pushback, just a really unique uh, time that we're at right now where, you know, there might be other times in our economic cycles where People are like, just yes, 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 just do it. Just take care of it. You know, I don't know. I like the article. It said that uh, being resilient is like having a generator and it's ready when there, when something happens rather than trying to figure out where the flashlights are. Yeah, good discussion. And then you also, you know, you got to look at this too from a business uh, a business standpoint in the terms of what you just said right there, Andre, which is things like that you can use in your favor to create a competitive advantage in your marketplace with this stuff. Like if you can demonstrate that your business can withstand these types of things and somebody like the federal government is looking to do business with you. So he, he, what I'm saying here, if you're in government contracting or manufacturing, uh, you can differentiate yourself by investing in that stuff. And by doing so you will, 100% be able to be the one who gets picked over somebody else because they don't worry that you won't be able to deliver on time and on budget when you go to manufacture this stuff for them. So <clears throat> it's not something that businesses are really taking advantage of right now. And, you know, when we talk to businesses and we say we can make technology competitive advantage in your business, they think we're just like promising something to, you know, it's marketing speak to, to make it sound good. But at the end of the day, like that's part of what, what we do. We look for opportunities in your market to say, hey, we've achieved a certain level of cyber maturity in our business that others haven't. And you might want to take a look at us over them because you don't know what you're getting in bed with over there. 
So, you know, companies need to start thinking this way when it comes to this stuff, and that'll help transition the the concept of cybersecurity being a cost center to, okay, we can turn this into, a, a, you know, a competitive advantage to get more business for us. And that's where, you know, what this article also points out, um, um, where, where this is only going to happen if board boards and and the c-suite start to take ownership in this stuff and stop pushing it off to you know their their it departments and their it um that's the bottom line because you're you're not going to think this way in the it department but people in the c-suite need to start thinking this way um and then that will shift the conversation it'll still obviously take place in, in the IT department, right? They're, they're going to execute on the vision and the plan for, for whatever the company's yeah. cyber, res, cyber resilience strategy is, right? But at the end of the day, the strategy should be developed in that boardroom and then delegated and executed by the IT people or the cybersecurity professionals, whatever you want to call them. But the technical people are, at the end of the day, are going to execute the plan. Um, and that's how it goes. And that's how we need to start thinking about this stuff if we're ever going to get to a cyber resiliency standard in business. So that's my thought. Any Anything you guys want to add to that? Good discussion, though. Um, going into this other one here, how are we doing on time? We got, we got like 10 more minutes, right? All right. So... Um, Article here that I found on Business Wire that at Bay, which is a pretty large insurer, guys, um, that their report reveals that more than one in four businesses fail to recover data from a backup <laughs> when hit by a ransomware attack. And the reason I wanted to kind of run through the article is because there's a ton of really good data in here. That backs up kind of the things I say on this show all the time, which are like the state of cybersecurity in this country, especially for private businesses, is not in a great place. Um, so let's go through, Andre, I know you're pretty good at running through articles pretty quickly and pulling out data points that interest you. Um, so you see anything right away that catches your eye outside of that, you know, uh, the fact that the report finds effective backups can reduce the likelihood of paying the ransom by as much as three times and that cloud backups improve recovery rate by up to 80 percent um what are your thoughts here yeah the, the one i specifically like is the despite 92 percent of businesses reporting having backups more than one in four businesses 31 percent fail to restore data so i could see this because a lot of it guys They'll get a daily report or they'll see a check mark in their cloud VM that says, yep, everything is good, but they fail to do actually, um, you know, restore and, and verify that the backups are, are good. Or in this case, because they're talking about ransomware, what you could have is both the data on the physical file server or the computer, it has the ransomware plus the backups. So um, I could I see that happening a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, and they'll go in and they'll, encrypt the backups so then they're not they're not usable or delete the backups so they're not usable or if they're in there long enough which you know it seems like the trend is towards shorter amount of time in there before they pull the trigger these days but if they're in there long enough just go in and change the backups to not back anything up and so yeah they're happening successfully every night and you're right it it, it has to be looked into um, and you have to be able to, to, to verify that all the data is actually getting backed up. I love the, the next statistic that talks about um, 1.5 times more likely to come back from the ransomware if the backups are off site. Um, you know, there's a buzzword that people throw around called air gapped. You know, are they, are they in a separate place where the criminals can't get to them? which would be one form of being air gapped. Um, and then if the backups themselves get encrypted, are you keeping snapshots? So at least you can go back and get to a place where they're not um, encrypted as well. Like, you know, yesterday or day before or whatever. Yeah. And some other interesting uh, things here is obviously, you know, 
pointing out that cloud backups are way more, way more effective, effective than um, than you know any traditional backup like disk backup or hopefully nobody's using tape today, but I know there's some out there that still use tape backups. Um, but successfully restoring data from backups reduces the overall cost of an incident by 41%, right? So just doing what Andre said right there, doing your test resource restores will reduce your overall cost in an incident by almost half. That's, you know, a pretty big deal, pretty big number, right? <clears throat> and then the cost of a ransomware claim is on average $200,000 greater for businesses who fail to successfully restore their data from a backup compared to those that do. So on average, you're gonna pay $200,000 more in an event if you're not doing test restores as Andre laid, laid out. So um, pretty interesting stuff there coming from an insurer who's basically like, hey, here's what we're seeing in the events that, that we cover. Um, and, you know, it also, uh, one last thing I want to point out that came in here that, um, you know, in February of this year, they released a ranking of the risks associated with today's most popular email security solutions, which found that Google Workspace customers experienced 40% fewer email security incidents compared to other email solutions in the category, meaning M365 slash exchange. Thoughts on that, guys, before we uh, move on to our last topic of the day. Email security, do you prefer one over the other or do you have an, do you, do your opinions line up to what the data shows here um, with fewer incidents for Gmail customers? Is it because there's less Gmail customers and, and just they're focusing on Microsoft tenants? That's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's the answer I was hoping I would hear from you guys. Um, you know, you got to watch, right? Because that's, this is the old, like, hey, Windows computers get hacked more than, than Mac computers, right? That's exactly, you know, what this is here. There's a hell of a lot more people. And there's a lot of people that use Gmail. Don't get me wrong. But there's a hell of a lot more people, especially in the enterprise world, um, companies that use M365. And, you know, the data can be skewed in that direction simply because, they're just targeting the M365 accounts and the domains over over Gmail. Um, now, do you guys feel in any way, shape, or form that one has a better email filtering service out of the box or one over the other? You're muted, Randy. I have some opinions. So what are your thoughts? Well, so first I would say there is that whole thing. I call it the small wall in a war syndrome. You know, imagine a giant battlefield. There's tanks and missiles and guns and all that. There's a little bitty three foot wall over there and you're hiding behind it. Well, no one's like shooting the missiles at the three foot wall because it's insignificant. So you get this, this false sense of security that, oh, oh, I'm safe over here behind this three foot wall. And that's that whole idea. Well, is 365 bigger for enterprise, you know, than Google Workspace? And then, you know, you're just less of a target. I would say, though, um, I do prefer 365. So don't don't shoot me here. Um, but uh, I, I do. But I would say out of the box for your average bloke that doesn't know anything about cybersecurity. Google's a better solution for some rando that just owned the business just to turn on because there's a lot of stuff that's just pre-configured and done for them where 365 has only like in the last year started turning on security defaults by default. And yeah. there's a lot less out of the box because you have a <clears throat> lot more to play with over on the 365 side. So I think your, your water level maybe is a little higher on the Google workspace, like your initial water level, but you yeah. can take it through the roof if you know what you're doing on 365. And I would say um, each day that goes by, they seem to provide a better experience out of the box from a security standpoint, 365 does, than they did the day before or last month or last year. Those are my two cents. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with actually all of that. Um, from what I, and, and I will 
also use this analogy for everybody so they kind of understand. Gmail is like owning an Apple iPhone and 365 is like owning an Android, right? So, you know, if you if you have just basic needs and you want to be secure, um, Gmail is a good product, right? But if we're talking about scaling it to enterprise levels and what you have available to you, M365 is world where the enterprise world is going to live and there's more you know, bells and whistles and things you can unlock and things that you can do on that device versus what you can do with, with Google Workspace and Gmail. Perfectly fine for most small businesses out there, um, but as you need to start to do more advanced things, use things like integrations and, and Power BI and all the integrations that the M365 ecosystem has, you're going to, you know, look at other reasons to move to that product. I would always recommend, though, you can get as good email protection in M365 if you go, and Randy, Randy and I will debate this, but yes, you can tweak 365 to a point where you don't see much spam email, but I always recommend a third party uh, <laughs> email threat protection product to ride over top of the M365 built in protection. So that's how we handle that. So last one, do we want to talk about this article on what CISOs uh, think about ransomware and what they deal with, or do we want to answer Steven's question? Personally, I always love the questions from the audience. How are you? Oh, I can answer Steven's question. All right. Yeah, just go on Google and type in, um, well, his question is, do you guys have any tips for business owners to find an IT cybersecurity company who specialize in and competent when it comes to cyber resilience? Uh, just go on Google and type in A R K S O L D E R S, and you'll see a phone number there. And just call that one; and it'll lead you to a good one. So, yep. That's or, a really or, good or you question. can call a company that has a certified cyber resilience professional on staff, like right. Exact Cybersecurity. <laughs> That's a really good question too, because yeah. as each day goes by, more and more IT companies are are saying you know throwing around cybersecurity words and this and that you know and they're t they're talking all the lingo it's a really tough time because we don't have, the laws haven't caught up to provide the uh you know the truth in advertising or truth in lending if you will um and since they haven't caught up there's companies that are saying they know but they really don't know that's a that's a i'm not really answering his question um Obviously, we would put ourselves up there in that list um, of the companies that can provide cyber resilience. Um, what do you say, Brian, for finding a company like that? I mean, like I said, I would look for a company that has a cyber resilience certification or something that they can prove that they know how to do cyber resilience for a business. Um, or you can just trust you know, a nice friendly face that says they know how to do it. I mean, it's your choice. I mean, this this is an unregulated industry. It has been since its inception. Um, I don't think there's any appetite to regulate it at this point with everything else that's going on in the world. Um, I don't think that this is at the top of anybody's list to start regulating. Uh, so it's going to be this way for a while. So it's kind of like buyer beware. You need to do your research. You need to understand who you're working with. Um, and, you know, your gut and uh, as a business owner and as business leaders will tell you who the right choice is, right? Or your budget. <laughs> uh, so, so CISOs, guys, um, we'll wrap it up here. We'll talk for like another five minutes. CISOs, the number of ransomware attacks organizations face has a direct correlation with the frequency with which uh, victims uh, pay the ransom. And the odds of a CISO encountering a major cyber attack are about as high as it can get with nine in 10 CISOs reporting at least one disruptive attack during the last year, according to Splunk. Almost half of the 350 security executives surveys said their organizations were hit by multiple disruptive cyber attacks during the last year. Um, 96 report, reported a ransomware attack and more than half experienced a ransomware attack that significantly impacted businesses. Four and five CISO surveys said their organization paid the ransom. So 
I'm going to let you guys kind of take that and wrap up the show here. I could be right back. <laughs> it, it leads me to wonder, I mean, I know this can happen with, with anybody, but if, if a company is big enough to have a CISO and they still get attacked, what does that say about the organization or the CISO, right? Because mm-hmm. again, we know it, it could, it's just that one user just takes that one phone call or whatever, but this is the CISO's job. Wow. I mean, it, it also makes me wonder. So the title makes me wonder and the, and the subtitle make me wonder, is there a list? And okay, so I'm not saying this about the actual people, but do the criminals have a list that's called the suckers list? And do they keep a list? These are all the companies that paid a ransomware. So like right now, MGM, they didn't make that it's list. Called, yeah, yeah, Randy, it's a great yeah. point because it's called LinkedIn and they just go, oh, this clown went to this place now. He sees so over here now. We're going to hit them now. Well, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's true. Then maybe they're following them around. And I'm just wondering, right. though, do they do they have a way to know who's paid the ransom and who hasn't? Because, you know, people that pay the ransom are more likely to get hit because we know that they're going to pay. That's that whole debate in the out in the real world about about kidnapping and paying a ransom. No, France, wrong. as a country, doesn't allow it. You never hear about French people getting kidnapped. Because what are they going to do? I mean, they might do it for I don't know for some horrible reason other than you know just getting money. Uh, something worse than that. But you you know what I'm saying? Like the fact that some people pay and some people don't. Does that make them more of a target? The word get out. Do they have a list of that? So you got to figure, right? I mean. What I know about kind of like the inner workings behind the scenes is like the ransomware negotiators kind of know the ransomware groups. The ransomware groups know the negotiators. There's been it's been reported that publicly that ransomware groups specifically ask for certain ransomware negotiators during events because they're easier to deal with or whatever. So we know that that's a thing. So why would it be out of the realm of possibility that they're just following CISOs around looking at their LinkedIn? And when they go from company one to company two, and they're, they're now targeting company two because they know that this guy, look, there, there's not a lot of CISOs in the world, guys, especially at big companies. Um, what Randy's saying here is not far-fetched, not far-fetched at all. This is a business, a criminal business operation and and if you know a certain CISO doesn't know what he's doing probably has weak cyber security and the last time you hacked one of the companies he was in charge of they just paid it makes a lot of sense there you go steven's on your website andre he's got he said they have a nice you have a nice website that was awesome great. thank you <laughs> wonder, wonder who built your website yeah <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for your input today. Uh, We are together live next week, so we're going to come at you somehow, some way, at some point next week. Um, And uh, we will be together in Florida, right? We're going to. And uh, so look for that. We'll we'll, we'll bring the show to you live uh, from Florida together. And then I think we're also doing an event. We're actually, the three of us will be on stage at the event we're going to. Uh, to kind of do like a, a mini show, mini uh, uh, security squawk show uh, in front of our peers and other MSPs. So we're very excited for that. And if we can get the recording and, and throw it up onto the social medias and, and all that, we will do that for sure. So look forward to next week. Look forward to seeing you guys in person again. It's been a year, so uh, I look forward to it. And uh, we'll catch everyone then. Take care.